Good morning, Chapel Hill. It is so good to see you this morning in the sanctuary and those online. Welcome. What a blessing it is to be together today. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we are called to rejoice and to be glad in it. So in that spirit, I want to invite you to find at least one person you have not yet met. Now this morning, you might have opportunity to get your steps in, but would you please share the peace of Christ with each other? Good morning and welcome to worship at Chapel Hill United Methodist Church in Wichita, Kansas. My name is Jeff Gannon. I'm the senior pastor. It is my privilege and honor to welcome you to worship. I want to invite you to get a candle and to light it as a symbol of Christ's presence with you as we worship together. I also want to encourage you to get out some bread and some grape juice or wine so that after the sermon today, we might participate together in the sacrament of Holy Communion. You are invited to our website, chwichita.org, and you will notice there that there's an opportunity to submit a prayer request. We genuinely hope that you will do that. We want to pray with and for you according to your needs. And if this service is a blessing to you and you feel led, we would invite you to also give financially. And there is an opportunity to do that at the website as well. Thank you again for joining us for worship and may God bless you and inspire you today. Rejoice, rejoice, believers, for now the time has come to worship God the Father. Please join me in prayer. You are indeed the Lord of all hopefulness and the Lord of joy and peace and contentment. And we've come this day with hearts that long for all of those things. We've come to worship you, to glorify you, to commune with you. And so we pray, Lord, that our hearts would be open to receive the word that the Spirit has for each of us today, that we might be bound together in love for you and love for one another. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, 
let's lift our voices together again and continue to give God thanks and praise for all that God has done and all that God is doing by singing together. From set you rule and reign in our hearts again, increase in our sweet. we do thank you that you are with us. We thank you that your grace is here. So this morning, God, fill our hearts with your presence so that we know that you are with us always.
This is a reading from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the fourth chapter. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. As for the things that you have learned and received and heard and noticed in me, do them and the God of peace will be with you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Wow, choir, that was beautiful. Chenille, thank you for your part in that. This is one of those Sundays where after hearing the anthem, if I were a smart man, we would do a quick communion and go have breakfast together. <laughs> Nothing more me needs to be said, right? Well, do we have any kiddos who are going to come down here? Courtney, you're going to lead the way. Anybody else want to come down here today? Come on down, please. I feel like Bob Barker. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to have all of you here today. Come on over here. I want to be able to see you, though. Some of you want to sit down there so I can see your faces, please? Thank you very, very much. Well, how's everybody today? Good. It's a good day, huh? Tired. You're tired today? What did you do to make you tired yesterday? Bailey? Were you in soccer? Yes, I'm soccer. Okay. Sir? Um, last, last time I played basketball, um, it, was, it was a game, and they tackled me, and they weren't supposed to. They tackled you? Yeah, when it wasn't tackled, it was flag football. It's flag football. There's no tackling. There's no tackling. I know. Well, what happened to the guy who tackled you? Well, it was a game. It was, it was in Winfield. It was in Winfield? Well, I'm sorry you had to go through that. And next, I just went on the sideline because that's like the resting area. The resting area. You needed a rest after that, didn't you? They literally tackled me. Holy cow. Well, that's not right for him to tackle you. They should have given him a 15-yard penalty, did they? Yeah. He's on my football team. I see him at school. I don't leave that. And Nero's real brother is, um, well, sometimes he, I think he likes to wrap Nero in the fist. I don't remember. Well, I'm so thankful that you feel free to share with us what's been going on in your life. That's wonderful. And you notice your sister's giving you a little hard time because she was doing this number, right? <laughs> Sister and brotherly love, right? Well, guess what? How many of you know some sign language? Okay, what's sign language for? It's when you make some signs with your hands for people that can't hear. That's right. You make signs with your hands for people who cannot hear. <clears throat> Pardon me. Hold on just a second, okay? Now, <clears throat> how many of you know sign language for the word peace. Well, that is not sign language for peace. <laughs> <laughs> have you learned sign language at Collegiate? Is that what they're teaching? You've got a good memory, I'll tell you that. And you know what? Rachel is at a retreat this weekend in, down in at Camp Winfield. What do we call it? Camp Horizon. So she's not able to be here today, but I'm thankful that I get to spend some time with you. So let's talk about peace in sign language, okay? Now, any of you know? I'm... Well, n let me show you how we talk about the peace of God. So get your hands up, and the adults can follow along if they want to. So you do this number, and then you put them like this, because this is like prayer and God, right? The peace, and you move your hands like this. Peace, and then you... Do this. Now, <clears throat> why do you think the hands like this, what does that remind you of? Praying. Praying. And then when you do this, 
What does that, why that? Just washing your hands. It's like you're giving it up. And then, what's this? Say it again, please. It has been sent. It has been sent. That's a good way to look at that. What else could it mean? Go ahead, both of you. What's that? Well, Go away. That's a good one, too. When you're washing your hands ago, that actually is called friction. Friction. Yes, you're right. That When you do this, that's called friction. That's exactly right. So why else this, though? Courtney? Well, that's a good one, too. You all come up with great ideas. What's your idea? Same. Everybody. Everybody. Well, those are wonderful ideas, but guess what? We pray, and then who does this? Um, God. God, and what does God do? He You're right. He does, but guess what else he does? This means he smooths things out. Because today I'm talking about what we do when we feel anxious, when we feel stressed, when we feel troubled. We pray and God will smooth things out. Isn't that interesting that in sign language, adults, you want to do this? You take your hands and then you like wring your hands like you're, you're praying to God and you're giving it to God and then you do this. God is at work. God will smooth things out. Well, let's pray, shall we? Can you repeat after me, please? Dear God, we are so thankful that you help us. You give us peace. You give us calm. You give us strength. Thank you, Jesus, for always loving us. Amen. Okay, how about a treat? Thank you. you are so welcome. Can I throw these toward you? you? You're welcome. Well, There's yours. You. Okay, did you get yours? <clears throat> Is there anybody here whose blood sugar needs a little rise? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming up today. Oh, Courtney, forgive me. Oh, you, you need another one? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, for mom. You need one for your mother? How clever of you. <laughs> These kiddos, <clears throat> you see why I don't do this every Sunday? They're smarter than I am. Thank you for coming up. Well, here's your treat, pastors. Well, that choir anthem was so powerful for many reasons. I'm thankful for your prayers during our week when we celebrated the birth of our grandchild, and I'm a terrible grandpa, I don't have any pictures, and when we celebrated my niece's... Oh, my goodness, there she is. You found it. There's actually a better one than that, but that's a good one. I'm thankful for that. Thank you, Jeremy. She loves her little hat, and her name is Goldie Noel Gannon, and so she's such a good baby. She loves to have her hand like this and like this. Anyway, you don't need me to go on and on. Thank you, Jeremy, for that. And then your prayers during the service, especially. I could just feel buoyed by prayer as we celebrated my niece's life at 46, died as a brittle diabetic of ketoacidosis. And her son, 13, the hardest part was just seeing him and his sobbing inconsolable. It's just a reminder that we, we need prayer. We need the presence and power of God with us in the ups and downs of life. So thank you. So may the words of my mouth and may the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, because you and you alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen and amen. Today I want to talk about finding peace in anxious times. Are we living in anxious times? I think we are. And if you were to do a poll of how anxious you are, how would you rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10? When you think of all that's going on in the world, all around us, even within us, how would you rank yourself? So a man was very much troubled 
by his dreams. He kept dreaming that he was either a pup tent or a teepee. One night he dreamt he was a pup tent. Another night he dreamt he was a teepee. And this just went on and on, and it was troubling him. So he went to his psychiatrist, and he said, Doctor, I need help. I keep dreaming that I'm a pup tent or a teepee. Can you help me? And the doctor said, well, I think the, the problem is quite clear to me. He said, well, what, what's the problem? He said, you're too tense. <laughs> Don't blame Dr. J for that bad joke, but he can get some mileage out of that. You're too tense. Some of you will get that on the way home. <laughs> but isn't it true that we all are too tense for a variety of reasons? Some of you know that we have 48 people who were supposed to go to the Holy Land on November the 6th. It's very, very likely that we're not going for all the obvious reasons. But people have been very appropriately anxious about that as have I. What if they say we can go? What is anxiety? Anxiety is a feeling of worry, unease, or discomfort in a given situation. And I think it's important to go into the Greek a little bit because anxiety in Greek means several things, but two things that I want to highlight for the sake of this sermon, is that when we are anxious, we are divided. We are divided in our feelings, we're divided in our thoughts, we're divided in our spirits. We find ourselves distracted and divided. The other thing that happens with anxiety is that we find ourselves feeling choked. It's, anxiety takes life. It removes air. It makes it harder to breathe, literally and figuratively. So look at the stats with me for a moment. I don't need to give these to you because we all know that we're living in anxious times. But this is a really recent poll, May 10th, 2023, conducted by the American Psychiatric Association, where 70% of all U.S. adults say they feel anxious or extremely anxious about keeping themselves or their families safe. I can relate to that. Can you? The poll went on to say in its results that 68% were anxious about keeping their identity safe, 66% were anxious about their health, 65% were anxious about paying bills or expenses, 59% were concerned about climate, 50% were anxious about the opioid epidemic, even though we've made some great advances in that area, and 45% were anxious about the impact of emerging technology on day-to-day -day living. Now, what's the point of this survey? Anxiety is high. We all are feeling anxious for a variety of reasons. The Journal of the American Medical Association went on to say, and please hear this, this is very telling. There's been an exponential increase in anxiety and depression three times compared to previous generations. And children today, this was the one that really got me, have the same level of anxiety as an adult who was hospitalized in the 1950s for behavioral health issues. Did you hear that? That's very significant. It tells us that children and youth and adults, no matter our age or stage in life, we all are feeling anxious. And that's why the last stat I want to share with you from JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, says that anxiety disorders have a lifetime prevalence of approximately 34% in the U.S. And what that means is that it's chronic or has the ability to significantly impair the quality of life and functioning. <clears throat> when I read the article, there was a medical doctor who said in response to that, that means that almost four out of 10 deal with chronic anxiety. It also means that six out of 10 are lying. 
Now, that was his take on it, that everybody is struggling with anxiety for a variety of reasons at a variety of levels. Max Lucado, in his book, Anxious for Nothing, has this quote, and I couldn't find the source, so if you can, let me know, please. But he says that according to his research, the United States of America is the most anxious nation on the earth, and that the land of stars and stripes has become the land of stress and strife. And one of the things that he talks about in his book is that they've studied people who move here from third world countries where life is really difficult. And guess what? The research shows that as they transition to America, as they live in America, their stress level, their anxiety level just continues to rise. So let me ask the question again. How anxious are you? How anxious am I on a scale of 1 to 10? If you would check in with yourself today, where would you say that you are? Now, there's some important things to say about anxiety before I actually get into teaching the text. What does it mean that we're so anxious? It means that we're human. It means that we are human beings. And God has created us to feel anxiety. Anxiety has a godly purpose in our life. And any person who's alive is going to feel anxiety. I had somebody say to me one day, Jeff, I want to be a non-anxious presence. And I say, well, the only way that you can be a non-anxious presence in today's world is to be dead. Anybody who has life, breathing, heart pumping, lungs working, will feel anxiety. It's part of the human experience. Here's the other thing that needs to be said. Experiencing anxiety does not mean that you're a failure or stupid or spiritually or emotionally immature or that you're not a Christian. Now, why am I saying that? Because the research also shows that many Christians live with a notion that to have any anxiety is to be living in sin and that you're less than you're not enough of, there's something wrong with you. You're defective. Let's just put that to bed today. Because Jesus himself battled anxiety. And I hope that we get to go to the Holy Land sooner than later when it's safe to do so. But my, one of my most favorite places, which may surprise you, Jan, is the Garden of Gethsemane. And one of the reasons why is because in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus gets down on his knees and we have the rock that it is likely that he was kneeling before. And on that rock in that place, with that olive tree that was there when Jesus did this, he was so anguished in his spirit. He was so full of stress and anxiety that he began to bleed from his pores. And the American Medical Association did an article on the life of Jesus from a physician's point of view, and they said, when you are under the most severe form of human stress and anxiety, you and I have the capacity to bleed through the pores. Jesus battled anxiety. If he battled anxiety, I think it's fair to say you and I will as well. Here's another important thing to say about anxiety. Anxiety, as you've heard me say, comes with being human, with life, but it does not have to dominate life. The presence of anxiety is unavoidable. The poison of anxiety is optional. And that's why I want to talk about it today. Here's another thing that's important to say. Anxiety can be managed. And God has made us to be a, a whole person. There's the physical. There's the spiritual. There's the emotional. There's the relational. We are, by God's design, complex individuals. Human beings are by nature and by God's design complex. So here's the thing I want you to hear. Anxiety can be managed physically through medication. 
If you need medication in order to treat your anxiety, there is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing that is unchristian about doing so. Likewise, you may need therapy to deal with the emotions. But today, I want to talk about the spiritual aspect. And the spiritual aspect does not take away from the physical or the emotional. They're all interrelated by God's design. So just because I'm going to give a sermon on anxiety does not mean, okay, Jeff, you're telling me to get rid of my medication and to stop going to therapy. No, no, no. There are various approaches and nuances to this because it's a complex subject. But we need all of that. So, let's look at the Scripture today. Who's the writer of the Scripture that was read by Monty? The Apostle Paul. He has written this letter to the Philippian Christians from his prison cell in Rome. Now, I wish I had better photos for you, but I want you to start with the photo on the right. And you will see that is a common Roman prison. There are some who believe that that was actually a very, not only typical Roman cell for, for Paul, but he may have inhabited it. Here's what we know. That little hole is the, the latrine, the, the lavatory, whatever you want to call it, the toilet. And they did that on purpose where the, all the sewage of the city of Rome would go underneath all of the cells and that hole is open. Do I need to say more? If you look on the left, you will see that it was very common at that time, even though the picture kind of depicts it, but not as fully as I would like. We know that the Roman soldiers were chained to the prisoner. And part of that was safety, meaning to keep the prisoner from escaping, and part of it was humiliation, so that when you're doing all the things that you have to do as a part of being human, such as using the lavatory, you had to do so in the presence of the soldier. Now the point is, Paul is not writing the words that you heard spoken from the ivory tower where everything's great, everything's perfect, everything's going well, everything's smooth. No, he's writing it from prison where he's experiencing despair and discouragement and anxiety and stress. Don't we have much more respect for people who write from the trench rather than people who say, well, life is great for me. I don't know why it can't be great for you. <sighs> so, let's break this down. How do we win the war on worry? How do we bring an antidote to anxiety? And I want to use Max Lucado's acrostic even though the content is mine. So if you don't like the content, don't blame Max, please. But he has a very clever way of creating an acrostic as to how we experience calm in the midst of the storm, how we experience peace when we feel panic. What's the C? Celebrate God's goodness. Look at the text. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now remember, where is he? In prison. With the sewage running underneath him. With the soldier chained to him. And he's saying rejoice. Rejoice. Well, how do we do that? So, how many of you know that the greatest tool that a circus trainer has with the lions and the tigers is Jan, say it louder please chair. the chair and why is the chair the greatest tool it has four legs and what does the lion or tiger do can't focus and therefore becomes paralyzed because the lion or the tiger has a need to look at each of the four and gets completely paralyzed and so is no threat to the trainer. What Paul is saying is focus on God. Celebrate God. Look at God. 
put your attention on the things of God because otherwise we get distracted and therefore we get paralyzed and we're frozen. That's why I love how Eugene Peterson says it. Celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in God. It's all a matter of where you put your focus. It's not practicing denial. It's not practicing repression or suppression. It doesn't have to be that. You can feel your feelings. You can think your thoughts. You can experience the anxiety, but you keep your eyes focused on the one who, in the words of Rich Mullen in that powerful hymn, won't you be my king of glory? Won't you be my prince of peace? You have been my king of glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? It's all about where you're going to put the focus. Now look at this second part. Let your gentleness be known to everyone the Lord is near. That Greek word epiakos has like 12 different meanings. <laughs> The bottom line is the scholars don't know exactly how it's going to be interpreted, so you can open up a Bible and it'll say gentleness, or it might say 11 other different things. I won't go through the list for the sake of time. And what does it mean? Well, my favorite definition, as if you care, is that that Greek word, epiakes, I needed to pronounce it more correctly this time means live a balanced life and don't live on the extremes. Now, if you're like me, in anxiety, it's too much or too little. Too much or too little sleep. Too much or too little exercise. Too much or too little drink. When I was in Spokane for my niece's memorial service, a pastor came up to me after the service and he said, do you realize that my son had a battle in his life, and he went into the details of that, and he said he actually drank too much water, and he killed himself because drinking water was his way of dealing with his anxiety. When you and I are anxious, we don't tend to be balanced. We tend to go to the extremes, and it's too much or too little, too much or too little. And the wisdom of God coming through Paul is when you find yourself feeling really anxious, be balanced. Eat the right amount of food, the right amount of exercise, the right amount of drink, the right amount of everything. Isn't it true? Here's the A. Ask God for help. Now look at this. 18 minutes. I have two minutes left and I'm only on A. Some of you are anxious about that. <laughs> Ask God for help. What does Paul say? Do not be anxious about anything. Now realize, this is where we need to take the time to look at the original language. This is present active tense in Greek, which means a state of perpetual worry. Paul, in his wisdom, recognizes you and I have been created by God to feel worry intermittently because it helps us realize that something is wrong. But it's when we live there when it's perpetual, that's when it has its damaging effects. But then he says, but in everything by prayer. And what is prayer, by the way? The simplest definition of prayer that I most relate to personally was uttered by St. Augustine. And Marianne, he lived a long time ago, didn't he? And what did St. Augustine teach about prayer? Now, he had some very complex things to say about a lot of different things, but his simple definition of prayer is profound. You know what he said? Offering your thoughts and your feelings to God. So when you feel something, you offer it up. When you think something, you offer it up, and you don't judge it. Well, why are you thinking that? Why are you feeling that? Why are you? You just offer it. Okay, God, I give it to you. But then, why does Paul say prayer and supplication? Why didn't he just say prayer? Offer it to God. Make it known to God. Why supplication? 
I have to hurry. I'm anxious about that, but I'm, I'm going to hurry anyway. So the simplest definition of the word supplication is a bird, a new bird that has just been born in a nest. And how does the bird receive its food? That's what the word supplication means. <clears throat> I'm learning that with our granddaughter. Can she ask for food? No. Besides crying, how does she indicate she's hungry? I love that image. It's an image of dependence. L, this is a harder one for me, maybe not for you. I'm really good at giving it to God, but I tend to take it back. There are days when I have yet to resign as the ruler of the universe. Am I alone? I needed that, Max. <clears throat> it's really hard to leave our concerns with God, and that's what Paul means by verse 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Max, Maxi Dunham, who is <clears throat> a professor pastor, now retired, who had brilliant ideas on this passage. He said, what Paul is teaching us is not just to offer it up to God, but to leave it with God and let God be God. But what are we really good at? Okay, God, take care of it. Well, on second thought, I'll take care of it because I think I can do a better job. And besides the fact, you're just, you're taking way too long. So, I'm wearing a tie today, which I rarely do, and you will see that there's on this tie <clears throat> a gift from Nancy Wallace, nothing but frogs. What does frog stand for? Fully rely on God. She gave me this tie after she introduced me to the God box. Now, I'm going to give you a soul training exercise, and if it works for you, great, and if it's not for you, that's okay too. But everybody needs practical ways to practice what I just talked about. Because the human nature is, I give it to God and I take it back. I give it to God and I take it back. That's why Peter says, cast your anxiety on God. Why did he use the image of casting? Because we cast and reel it in. We cast and reel it in. Cast your anxieties on God and leave them there. The God box. I had never heard of a God box before. Nancy Wallace taught me about the God box, where you literally write on a piece of paper what it is that you're struggling to let go of, and you put it in the God box, and the next time you think you know better than God, that you're not yet ready to really surrender it, you go and take the piece of paper out and say, okay, God, I'm not ready to give it to you yet. I'm going to take it back. So, some of you know, I, I go to the Sam's Club just to talk with the employees. So there's an older man there. He's been there forever and a day. And he, I call him Mr. Clarence because he looks like Clarence the Angel in the movie It's a Wonderful Life. I honestly don't know what his real name is, but I call him Mr. Clarence. So one day he said, I've got a burden I just can't let go of. I said, have you ever heard of the God box? No, I've never heard of the God box. So he said, I'm going to get a God box. And he did what I was describing. And he said to me just the other day, you know what, Jeff? <clears throat> that God box works. Because I would put stuff in there and then I'd start thinking about, well, I'm stewing about this. And I, I'd go in and say, okay, God, I still want to be the ruler of the universe. And he said, the other day, I put something in that God box, and I left it there, and I can genuinely tell you, I've experienced the peace of God because I've been able to surrender it. Now, 
If that's not the practical tool that helps you, find something that can. I'll tell you one another. I didn't do this at 9.30, but you, there has to be some benefit to coming to 11, right? So I have this orthodox prayer rope. And when I feel really anxious, I pray the Jesus prayer. And one day I was talking about this and a person raised their hand and said, well, Jeff, Jesus said you should not engage in vain repetition. And I said, well, what Jesus was against is vanity, not repetition. It's the spirit in which you do it. So what do I do? I say, Lord Jesus, have mercy. And I just go through this. There's nothing magical about the prayer rope. It's just a tangible way for me to engage with the God who is able to do what I can. And I just go through my prayer rope and I pray for people, I pray for situations and every bead represents something that I'm worried about. And when I'm really anxious, it really helps me. It's not the prayer rope that helps me. It's the means to the end. It helps me focus on the God who has the power to do something about it. The M, meditate and regulate. I promise I'll be quick here. But this is important. Meditate and regulate. What did Paul say in his wisdom? Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, what's his point? The word meditate, thinking, mean... How many of you have seen a cow chew their cud? We don't have many rural people here, but what do they do when they're chewing their cud? Gail? They chew and chew and chew and chew. The word meditate is you think over and over and over and over and over. And what Paul's saying is, be careful what you think about. My brother, who has been helped tremendously by AA, he knew he had a drinking problem, which led him to AA. And what changed his life is when at an AA meeting, after he shared about his thinking, this person looked over at him and said, I'm breaking all the rules of cross-talking here, but you, you think you have a drinking problem. You have a thinking problem, and that's why you drink too much. Your way of coping with your thoughts is to drown them with alcohol. The truth is, according to St. Paul, speaking the wisdom of God, you and I have to think about the things that we think about because you and I can't control our circumstances, but we can control how we think about them. And the word repentance, metanoia in Greek, is to think about what you think about. Sometimes we need to get rid of our stinking thinking and this is not just as simple as the power of positive thinking. That's a piece of it. It's much more deep than that. It's really a matter of where you're going to put your focus. Let me close. And by the way, when you and I do that, it regulates our anxiety. The science proves that. Who is this guy? Anybody know? Larry, what'd you say? James Cash, Penny. James Cash Penny. During the Depression, what happened to him? He lost his business. He went bankrupt. He went into emotional, spiritual, physical despair and discouragement. 
He was hospitalized. He wouldn't take the medication. He wouldn't see a therapist. He was lying on the bed <clears throat> in total despair. And one Sunday afternoon, this little tiny church choir from this very seemingly insignificant church was walking through the hallway singing, Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. And then they sang that chorus, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. And that message woke him up. And he got out of bed. And he went to his doctor and said, I'm ready for medication now. And he went to his therapist and said, I'm ready for therapy now. He came alive. Sometimes it's the simple, the ordinary ways, such as a tiny church choir singing an old hymn with a powerful, timeless message. God will take care of you, no matter what happens. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Let's pray together, my friends. O oh God, in the peace that passes all understanding, we pause to name our joys and our concerns before you. We rejoice with Haley Herndon and Josue Hernandez in their wedding this weekend, and we pray your blessing on their new life together as a married couple. And God, there is so much in our world today that grieves our hearts, that grieves your heart. We pray for the Middle East. Oh God, we pray for the Israelis and the Palestinians who are now living in the midst of so much violence and so much pain. We pray for all of those in Afghanistan who have been affected by the recent earthquakes. And we pray for those in our own church family who need a touch of strength, of healing. God, we continue to pray for Marita and Mark, Susie, and the death of Marita's mom, Minnie Lou Griffith, as they celebrate her life this Thursday. We pray for Mike McLean as he prepares for a procedure tomorrow. And we pray for Officer Ed as he recovers, for Dr. Knight, Lavana Robinson, Larry Bookless, Jerry and Rosa Wilson, and all of those on our continuing care list, as well as the prayers, the needs, the joys that we hold in our hearts. God, as we turn once again to the giving of our tithes and our offerings, we give ourselves most of all. And we pray that you move in and through and among us to be glorified. For we love you and we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. As our ushers come to wait upon the congregation, I invite you, if you haven't already, to find the connection folders. They'll be on the center aisle of each row. Um, inside, you'll find blue sheets to use if you are a visitor, white if you consider Chapel Hill your home, and we also invite you to share any prayer concerns you might have.
Thank you, Maria and Max. I invite those who are helping to serve communion to come forward at this time. I'll give some instructions on how we take communion if you're first time, if you're a guest here today, after we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Please join me now in the prayer known as the Great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing everywhere and always to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so we join our voices with all the company of heaven as together we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, Lord, we're bold to pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Make us one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes event again and we all feast at his heavenly banquet. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now let us pray together the prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Table is now open. If you're a guest, first time visitor with us, we take communion by method of intinction. That means that you come forward from the front section, uh, front of each section with open hands, receive the wafer, dip that into the cup, eat that, and then return to your seats. There's a gluten-free station uh, back by the doors and individual communion cups, if that's how you prefer to take communion today. Jesus Christ. 
So everything I was trying to say in the sermon, they just sang. Thank you. That was beautiful. Yes, we're very grateful. <clears throat> so today is Chapel Hill 101. For those of you who are new or newer to Chapel Hill, if you want to hear about our mission, we spend an hour together from 2 to 3. Just meet at the west entrance, and we'll take you to the lower level. BYF. Stand up, please, Suzanne. And Jan, I thought I saw you somewhere. There she is. These two, along with Lori and Frank, are leading Best Years Fellowship, a ministry for those 50 plus or those who wish they were. And this week, you do not want to miss Wednesday, 10 a.m., because Stan Greer and David Hawkins are going to perform, and it will be entertaining. But you're going to be at the Welcome Center to receive reservations, right? because the meal of the day is liver and onions. So, uh, <laughs> just kidding. Some of you actually like liver and onions. Now, Trunk or Treat is coming up. It's a tremendous outreach ministry to our community. On the 22nd of October, we have plenty of treats, but we need more trunks. So if you're willing to open up your trunk and you can decorate it how you would like within reason, then you can be blessed by all these children who come through. It's an amazing event. I think we had eight or 900 last year. So we need a few more trunks if you're willing to share. There's a sign-up sheet at the discipleship table, which is right in front of the sound booth. Pastor Ben is a gifted prayer, and he's going to be at the cross to pray with and for you according to your need. So if you're able, would you stand, please? And to the degree that you are comfortable, Courtney, come on over here, please. Find a way to connect with your neighbor. And sometimes we got to get creative in this connection. But it is a powerful reminder that we belong to Christ and we belong to each other. In the moments of life when it's hard, we need Christ and we need each other. And so go forth into this new week and be reminded you are never, ever alone. For the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is upon us and is doing more within us than we could ever imagine or think. So go now in his peace. Amen 
and amen. Let's sing, Go With God. Bless you, Jan. Good morning and welcome to worship at 